which I'm not sure if that's a record, but it's certainly way above average. Uh, and we're, but nevertheless, we're delighted to have you all here. Um, let me just review the uh, order of the proceedings. Uh, of course, Michael will be making a presentation. During the presentation itself, I suggest that the questions be directed uh, toward uh, increasing clarity of the presentation, if there are such. And then at the end of the presentation, the public will be given the opportunity to ask questions of any sort, including matters of more uh, substance. And then uh, they will be uh, gracefully excused, and the committee will continue with further conversation and questioning of the candidate, and then he will be excused, and we'll uh, proceed. Um, Michael probably does not need an introduction, but nevertheless, it's traditional to provide such. Uh, it came to us from Clarkson, way up north, uh, in, the, in the far north country of, of New York. Has been here now several years. He acquired a National Science Foundation fellowship, which we much appreciate. And of course, is a distinction for him as well. And he's been pursuing his thesis topic since that time. And today he will present uh, on, on the topic you see before you. So Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dowell. Uh, thank you all for coming again. Uh, today we're going to be going through several slides uh, which explore the challenge of predicting accuracy of reduced order models for fluid flows. Now it is my hope that this is the first time that a lot of the public audience is seeing such a topic, in part because it means that you can't tell me when I'm wrong, uh, but we'll do our best to make it informative and entertaining for all attending as well as uh, the committee finding it satisfactory. So the principal challenge in a lot of fluids engineering is the challenge of prediction. So uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, Duke University was almost hit by a very dangerous hurricane named Florence. Uh, and you can see on the slide now a the actual trajectory of the hurricane. Now, originally, the hurricane was projected to go directly through the center of North Carolina. Uh, a lot of the state was preparing for a disaster like they hadn't seen for quite some time. Uh, but then at the last minute, it stalled over Wilmington, much to the chagrin of Wilmington, but much to the fortune of the, of the Raleigh area. And it ended up moving quite a ways west of us. Uh, we ended up getting through this um, relatively unscathed. That being said, a lot of resources were spent preparing the wrong part of the state for this storm. Uh, likewise, the predictions are central to the simulation and design of um, very advanced vehicles that move through uh, fluids, including air and water. Uh, here are several snapshots of some very complex buffeting flows that have been simulated by an esteemed colleague of mine, uh, Kai Bastos. Uh, you can direct all questions to him. Um, these simulations are very complicated, but also very necessary for us to perform in the process of designing aerospace vehicles, industry vehicles, cars, boats, submarines. Uh, and the accuracy of these simulations is quite large. So the more equations you have in a model, the more expensive it is to solve. Uh, if you're told to solve for x, and then you're told to solve for x and y and z and t and phi and theta, of course, you understand that the second example is significantly more complicated than the first. Um, the number of equations in these kinds of simulations causes the computational cost to actually run those simulations to be extremely high. And so if we can lower the computational cost of these simulations without removing the quality of the prediction of the model, that means that we can much more uh, reliably explore the potential options, maybe better predicting where hurricanes are going to land, maybe better design aircraft uh, with less expense for the engineers and the companies designing them. So at the center of predictions is computational cost. In general, we have a correlation between accuracy and model complexity. Uh, for those who are familiar with fluid modeling, I've got a couple of references here, but for those who are not, just Keep an eye on the arrow. So it tends to be the case that we've got a direct correlation with accuracy and model complexity. 
If we want a more accurate answer, we need a more complicated model. The goal of reduced order modeling is to lower model complexity without losing accuracy. We get significantly more bang for our buck, uh, the goal, of course, being that it's predictable and reliable. There are a lot of different ways that engineers talk about this reliability, this predictability. Um, so one of them is having fewer equations within the model. Uh, if we have a certain number of equations and we simply down select the number that we actually use, that is a less expensive model in the sense that it is reduced order. You have reduced the number of equations. Uh, another perspective on this same goal is talking about a smaller dimension. Instead of simulating every spot in the blue oval, if you know that the answer is the torus, then if you only simulate the torus, you are saving computational cost. You are not wasting resources trying to simulate parts of the physics that don't matter as far as your answer is concerned. Uh, all of these goals mean the same thing. We want lower computational cost. So model empiricism is a common way that we can identify the kind of simplifications that we have between accuracy and model complexity. In fluid flows, the simplest fluid models are arguably that of the Euler equations, where there is no viscosity within the model. Uh, I'll take this point as we're getting into nomenclature. Uh, there are going to be quite a few equations throughout this, uh, this talk but I'm going to try my best to use layman's words while speaking. So if you enjoy looking at the equations, please enjoy them. Uh, if you have any clarifying questions, chat, please feel free to put them directly through that Slido link that I've got, uh, and I'll answer them uh, as best I can uh, when I have the time. Uh, my committee has uh, full wherewithal to unmute themselves and ask whatever they'd like, whenever they'd like. So. If we go up from the Euler equations, we move on to the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes simulations. So these simulations are still empirical. They employ turbulence models to capture the subgrid scale dynamics. If we move up even further into more robust models like a large eddy simulation, we have spatial filtering. And again, subgrid scale modeling uh, like the dynamics Magorinsky model, which allows us to capture those small scales. For direct Navier-Stokes or direct numerical simulation, these are arguably the most accurate fluid simulations we can compute right now. However, uh, those simulations have significant resolution challenges. We don't necessarily know if we have the correct resolution uh, until we test a lot of them. So in all cases, this empiricism is employed at the small scales. We'll talk about what that means conceptually a little bit later. But for right now, I hope we see a, a, common, a commonality in these different methods and how they are all limited in similar ways. The challenge is capturing the small scales. So we need to look at a problem which has small scales in order to best understand what exactly they're going to do. So uh, the test problem we're using for this presentation, all of the results are going to be organized in a similar way, is the regularized 2D lid-driven cavity. I'm going to slip up and use the word turbulence. Um, I understand that turbulence is not necessarily the same in three dimensions and two dimensions, uh, but I hope that you all give me some, some liberty with that term when I say that it can become turbulent. The nice thing about the lid-driven cavity is that as we increase the Reynolds number, as we make the flow uh, messier, uh, we have a dramatic change in the characteristic dynamics of the system. A lot of the plots in the presentation are going to be organized like the three animations you see on the bottom of the screen. On the left, we have a periodic flow. This is relatively simple. It looks complicated here, but relative to the other flows, it's relatively simple. Um, it's going to be dominated by one or two frequencies, uh, the fre what real specifically one frequency and its harmonics. So you're going to have a, again, relatively simple physical system. As you turn up the Reynolds number to 17,000, you see that the flow becomes quasi-periodic. This means that it's still pretty coherent, but it's dominated by multiple frequencies, not just one. As you turn the dial up even further and you have a chaotic Reynolds number, this is where the flow truly becomes what some would consider turbulent. This is where you have a broadband frequency spectrum. You don't have one frequency like a spring mass damper. You don't 
of two or three frequencies, like something that you can articulate, again, using discrete point masses. Uh, this is very, very messy. And this is kind of the, 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 the truest of the true fluid, nonlinear fluid dynamics problems. Uh, this is the hardest of the three. So in general, this is the organization of a lot of our slides from here on out, is we're going to have periodic on the left, quasi-periodic in the middle, and chaotic on the right. So this talk is organized as follows. We've got four major points we're going to be hitting. The first is an outline of a classic reduced order modeling approach. Uh, hopefully this exposes uh, the less experienced members of the audience to how exactly we go about the research that we conduct. Uh, for those who have read my dissertation or are familiar with, uh, with the content of this talk, this is the proper orthogonal decomposition. This is the classic, uh, the classic well, ex well, well accepted 50 year old approach to, uh, to reduced order modeling of fluids. We'll see that it works unpredictably for fluid flows at best. It can work, but unpredictably. We're then going to move to a new perspective on the classic approach. This, uh, again, we're going to call the resorted POD or the resorted proper orthogonal decomposition. Uh, we're going to find that it works more predictably for periodic flows, but it doesn't really do anything to help us at the higher Reynolds numbers. We're then going to look at an alternative approach, uh, which we're going to call the two basis POD. We're going to find a lot of excellent results with this approach. We're going to see that it works more predictably for all fluid flows, not simply those of a simple dynamical state. Uh, we're then going to see a more ambitious alternative approach called the multi-scale POD. And while it shows promise, uh, this one's not quite ready for prime time. Uh, we, are, we are as close to the leading edge as we can here at Duke University, and uh, we will certainly do our best to show the shortcomings of our research as well as the successes. So spectral methods, uh, this is a category of fluid mathematics and physics that is central to the uh, approach that we are employing to simulate and capture the dynamics of fluids using reduced order models. This equation is at the center of spectral methods. Fundamentally, what you are doing with a spectral method is you are breaking a multivariate dependence into a sum, a linear sum of single variate dependences. So what that means is that we have a velocity field u. This is a function of space x and time t. Uh, this is going to be broken down into a linear sum over n. So you're going to have n1, n2, n3, n4, n5, and so on. A sum of temporal coefficients a and spatial modes phi. Uh, you add enough of these together and you approximate the answer as a sum of the parts. In a very, very general sense, there are two categories when it comes to what the modes phi look like. You tend to have either system agnostic modes or system specific modes. <clears throat> uh, system agnostic modes are often named after someone uh, you, these are your Fourier's and your Bessel's and your Chebyshev's and your Legendre's and your Lagrange polynomials and your Taylor series. Uh, finite elements, finite element methods employ um, system agnostic modes. You've got linear or quadratic or third order finite element shape functions. Uh, Chebyshev um, functions, Bessel functions, these are all system agnostic modes because you can pick them. You can define what they look like regardless of what your system actually is. On the other side of the line, you've got system-specific modes. These are mathematically characterized often as eigenfunctions. They're normally dynamically significant. So you see that a single mode over an airfoil, like you can see in the top left picture there, uh, it's a very complicated shape. This is one mode. This is phi one. Um, it's a very complicated shape. It's not going to be a linear function. It's not going to be a basic trigonometric function. Instead, you're going to have uh, a lot of mess going on that's identified from the system itself. Uh, now, this line is kind of fake. You know, often you'll see that some eigenfunctions for a system are based on, you know, Fourier modes or Bessel functions or things like that. So this is half of a false line. But in general, you approach the problem by either selecting system agnostic modes or system specific modes. Of course, the questions that we ask, depending on which ones we select, differ. 
So if you're picking system agnostic modes, how many are needed? Often quite a few. Uh, on the other side, system specific modes, how are they found? Well, you normally have to be pretty careful about how you find them and how you down select the ones that you include. Reduced order modeling is generally based, specifically in this presentation, it is based on system specific modes. So the approach to constructing a reduced order model can be broken down into six, uh, I won't say simple, but six direct steps. The first step is to pick your governing equations. In fluid flows, this is the Navier-Stokes equations. This is a very uh, challenging equation to work with. There, uh, there's quite a bit of money on the line for someone to find uh, an analytical solution to this equation. Uh, we're going to do our best to approximate it using these empirical methods. So your step one, pick your governing equation. This can be done for any dynamical system. Then you perform a modal expansion. This is where we replace the velocity field u with our modes phi and our coefficients a. Now, for those really closely following along, you'll see that we also have an extra term u naught. That extra term isolates the boundary conditions for this problem. This is known as a Galerkin decomposition. I'm not going to jump into the formalities of that approach. For right now, I'm just going to say that u naught satisfies the boundary conditions for the problem and the fluctuations are captured around that general solution by the temporal coefficients a and the spatial modes phi. We then uh, select a modal basis. So the modal basis that we select is whatever we'd like it to be. We can pick the POD based on some optimization problem, which we'll talk about later. We can select dynamic mode decomposition. We can use uh, system agnostic modes like Chebyshev or Lagrange. We can pick whatever we'd like. Somehow, uh, through the powers that be, we determine the fees for the problem. Once we have the fees, we then perform a weighted integral. The weighted integral isolates the temporal information from the spatial information. Now, uh, I'm, I understand that quite a few people in the audience may not have experience with uh, higher calculus. So the concept of these integrals is the following. All of the spatial information is contained, hopefully you can see my cursor, all of the spatial information is contained within these integrals and all of the time information is contained outside of the integrals. That's the big thing that we're doing here. We're separating the space from the time. So then immediately we get the matrix equations. This is performed, this is, this is uh, just a, a different way of representing the weighted integral. That's why it's step 4.5. Um, once you're familiar with linear algebra, you're able to see immediately where uh, four goes to 4.5. Again, you see that we have a separation of space and time for the most part. So we have several, all of the gray matrices and vectors are not a function of time. But the pressure term, the P on the right, this unfortunately is still a function of time. This brings us to step five, cancel as much as is humanly possible. So the more terms you cancel, the simpler the model is going to be. The challenge as always is to make sure that you don't cancel too much. You have to make sure that you cancel only that which you know can be reasonably canceled. Take the pressure term in this particular model. So the pressure term can be decomposed using uh, the product rule and the divergence theorem. You can show uh, using some theory that I'm not jumping into here, but if anyone is interested, I, I can go more deeply into why this term can be canceled. Uh, these individual components of the integral can be shown formally to equal zero. This means that the pressure term itself is zero, which means the entire governing equation has been simplified to a fully separated space-time system. So instead of having a complicated nonlinear uh, space and time partial differential equation like we started with, we now have a, a set of ordinary differential equations uh, on 4.5 where we only have to compute all of those matrices once. They are not functions of time. You can save them on your computer, load them in when you want, and simulate the system as many times as you would like. This is the general approach to reduced order modeling. This can be done for any system. We have employed it for 
nonlinear fluid flows. So the, oh, and then of course you numerically solve. Step six is apply this to your, your favorite numerical solver. This may be ODE 45 in MATLAB. This may be some sort of integrator in Python. You can write your own if you don't have enough time during this isolation period. Um, so this is the entire approach. The big trick with this approach is selecting your modal basis. Step three is the, uh, the fundamentally challenging part of this approach. The rest of it is kind of cut and dry. Um, one way to select that modal basis is the proper orthogonal decomposition. So the POD seeks a modal basis fee. These are the spatial components. So uh, I appreciate the forgiveness of the audience for me simplifying my notation. Um, so I'm going to ignore the U naught component, although we have performed Galerkin decomposition in this research. It just makes the notation easier if we assume that I'm doing the expansion of a velocity field u. More specifically, this is ud, the fluctuating component, but I hope you can forgive me for that notational simplicity. So uh, the modes phi need to be picked. So if we've got a spatial domain d, this is the general problem. We don't know exactly where in this potato the actual answer to the problem is, but we know it's somewhere in here. I can tell you before I run anything that the answer is not outside of this space D. If we find a particular modal basis which solves this particular optimization problem, we can, if we know the particular solution potato S that exists within the domain potato D, if we know exactly where that is to begin with, we've run some very expensive simulations, we've done experiments in a wind tunnel, uh, however we do it, uh, if we know in a, to a certain extent where the solution exists, we can find modes, uh, it's a linear basis L, which overlaps S as well as we can make it do. What this means is that instead of needing to simulate the entire domain D, we only capture the important dynamics, those which identify the solution space S. If you remember an animation from a couple of slides ago, this is the same perspective that we talked about with the torus, where instead of capturing the entire blue ellipse, instead we're going to only capture um, the torus itself because we know generally where it is. There are some nice mathematical properties that come out of this particular problem. Uh, you have orthonormality within the modes. You find a, an uncorrelation of temporal coefficients. Uh, more specifically, you can find that the mean square of the temporal coefficients are the eigenvalues for the system. Uh, and perhaps best of all, this can be solved with the singular value decomposition. This is uh, an eigenvalue this is the eigenvalue problem of rectangular matrices. It is a well understood linear algebra technique. Uh, I want to thank my committee member, Dr. Gavin, for teaching me more than I thought I could ever learn about the singular value decomposition. Perhaps best of all, it is unique. There is one answer to the problem. This is a nonlinear problem. This is a nonlinear attractor that we're trying to capture, this space S. We're spanning it linearly, but the modes themselves are very complicated. But the method of solving the problem, the method of finding the modes, is linear. There is only one answer. We do not have to worry about Pareto frontiers. We do not have to worry about iterative methods for identifying the modal basis. The chaoticity of the system does not affect the fact that we have a single basis phi, which we can solve using a, a well-understood, very fast, very robust algorithm that identifies the singular value decomposition. The best thing about it is that it works. So reduced models based on the proper orthogonal decomposition give us remarkably accurate, remarkably inexpensive results. On the left, you see uh, probably a slightly choppy, thanks to my internet connection, uh, simulation that took several days to run on my personal computer. You can see that the number of equations is close to 70,000. These are pretty expensive simulations. Um, this is the closest to the truth that we're going to get for this research. Um, you can see on the right, this is a simulation of the same problem using only 150 POD modes, specifically the first 150. We pick them eigenvalue. 
This simulation took seconds to run. It was actually faster to simulate it than it was to save the results and load them in at a later time. That is how fast these simulations are. Um, unfortunately, it does not work predictably. This is the core of the problem of the research that we've been doing. So how do we identify a lack of predictability? I've got two error metrics here. Um, again, this is going to be periodic on the left, and then we're going to add some more plots later. Um, the, so specifically, the black error metric is a uh, percent error where one is 100%. This is a normalized error of the fluctuating kinetic energy of the global system. Um, the red line is a more sensitive error metric, which accounts more specifically for each individual mode's contribution. So even if the 10th mode doesn't contribute that much in amplitude, but it's wrong, the red line is going to capture that. Uh, for the broader audience, black line, less sensitive, red line, more sensitive. Zero is good. Zero means no error in a mean or standard deviation sense. So we have overall a pretty good result. Um, you can see, even at this periodic flow, again, this is the simplest of the dynamical cases. For some reason, when we have 14 modes in the basis, we have a very, very good answer. We have something like 8% error in the mean and the standard deviation of the fluctuating kinetic energy. And all of the uh, coefficients themselves are in agreement. Then when you add a single mode, when you have 15 modes in the basis, all of a sudden, the more sensitive error metric flies off the charts. There is no way before we ran all of these reduced order models for us to know that that was going to happen. As you would expect, this only gets worse when you increase the Reynolds number. At a Reynolds number of 17,000, again, you can get good results. The question is, where? How would I know beforehand that I need more than 200 modes to get an accurate answer? Perhaps more importantly, how would I know that more than 250 modes actually worsens the accuracy in terms of the red norm? Before we run all of these reduced order models, we're just throwing darts in the dark. And as you would expect, the problem only gets worse as you increase the complexity of the system. When the, fl when the fluid flow is fully chaotic or turbulent, um, you're going to have a very high sensitivity to the dimension of the reduced order model, the number of modes you retain, and you're going to have a high fluctuation in the error going anywhere from plus or minus 20% to significantly worse, depending on the particular modal dimension. Again, uh, I encourage anyone who isn't sure about anything I'm talking about, me included, uh, you can submit questions electronically uh, for the live stream, and my committee can jump in whenever they'd like. In general, no predictable performance means no reliable application. Again, we needed some results to get these reduced order models in the first place. So if the reduced order model does not add anything to the overall efficacy of the simulation, why would we do it in the first place? If we can't say before we run something that it's going to work, we can't trust it from an engineering sense. That's a problem that needs to be solved before reduced order models can be uh, in any sense applied with confidence to engineering systems. We're trying to do a little bit of that in this presentation. So uh, the only thing that we have as far as predictability in the classic POD is the eigenvalue spectrum. Uh, for those who are following the math, uh, as a reminder, the eigenvalues for the POD modes are the mean square of the coefficients. You can find these through the singular value decomposition, so we get this order for free. When I say we use 10 POD modes, I mean we're picking the first 10 based on the order of these eigenvalues. Um, so the vertical line on this plot is the maximum number of modes we can have. Uh, again, for those following the math, this has to do with the rank of the snapshot matrix provided to the singular value decomposition. Uh, generally, this just means we can't, in this case, have more than 35 modes. The classic approach to selecting a certain number of POD modes is to sort them by eigenvalue. Again, the eigenvalue defines the kinetic energy contained within the mode. So you're going to have the most kinetic energy within your first mode. You're going to have the next most amount of kinetic energy in the second mode, so on and so forth. 
And then you say, okay, well, I want to keep 99% or 99.9% or 95% of the kinetic energy. You relatively arbitrarily pick a number and decide that that is enough. You pick the ones above that number. So in this case, you need seven modes, it looks like, in order to have 99.9% of the kinetic energy uh, at this periodic flow. And you run with that. Hopefully, that's good enough. That's that's the best we've got as far as predictability is concerned. This gets significantly harder as, again, you increase the Reynolds number. You can't see within the eigenvalue spectrum a reason to pick a certain magnitude for the cutoff. In linear systems, for those who are familiar with the singular value decomposition or eigenvalue decompositions in general, which result in, in eigenmodes that can be used for a dynamical simulation, for linear systems, you tend to have a plateau. So again, hopefully you can see my cursor. In a linear system, this may have a trend up here. And then at a certain point, there is a large cliff. And then the eigenvalues will continue down here. If that was the case, then you could see the cliff and say, all right, well, I'm going to keep everything above the cliff. This is a nonlinear problem and a multi-scale problem. And we'll talk about some of those, those details later. But generally, this doesn't work. So how can we identify the size of the modal basis? Well, there are two ways, again, classically. One is by picking that retention fraction, and the other is by saying, OK, worst case scenario, we're going to keep as many modes as is humanly possible. These are not reduced order models anymore. We're talking about thousands of modes. But we know that the dynamics are contained within x modes. With these two, uh, these two metrics, we thought it was worth identifying a trend in the size of the modal basis. So uh, the circles here are the maximum number of modes, and the triangles are 99.9% uh, uh, of the kinetic energy within the modal basis. Um, and you see that both of these retention methods actually follow a trend proportional to Reynolds number to the three halves. Now, this is dynamically significant. To the best of our knowledge, no one has done this with POD modes before. Uh, this scaling behavior in the chaotic cases, oh, as, uh, just as a note, within this plot, um, I've demarcated with vertical lines the bifurcations of the system. So the C regions are the chaotic regions, and those C regions are most specifically where you're going to have the scaling to the three halves to be the most accurate. Um, this scaling behavior is one of the only uh, assessments we have from first principles, thanks to Kolmogorov, um, to the ratio of largest scales to smallest scales. Uh, it's significant that the POD modes exhibit this trend as well, because again, this relationship has never been identified with an empirical method like the POD. It's only ever been assessed by order of magnitude using first principles like those that Kolmogorov put together, or um, assessments using spatial resolution within DNS simulations. But again, POD modes are global. So this is not about resolution. This is about capturing dynamically significant structures. So why then does POD not work for turbulence? So in general, the POD is the solution to this optimization problem. Specifically, this is an L2 norm optimization of the modal basis projecting onto the velocity field. It's reasonable to, to say, then, that the POD works well if the L2 norm captures the system characteristics. If I tell you that I need to save as much gas as possible when I'm driving down the highway, and I then solve the problem for saving as much gas as possible, well, that's great. If instead my problem is not gas efficiency, but maybe it's the weight of a bridge, but that's not what I'm optimizing for, the engineering problem doesn't work. So if the L2 norm optimization is good for a particular problem, then the POD will work well. There are a lot of systems which are characterized very well by the L2 norm optimization, or by the L2 norm in general. All linear systems are characterized or characterizable by the L2 norm. Uh, systems which have large or local scale dynamics being dominant, these are also characterized very well by the L2 norm. 
large scales span the entire space, so the L2 norm captures them. If you've got a particular scale, a local scale, which uh, is dominant, then again, that dominant scale will be captured specifically by the L2 norm. A lot of physical systems fall into this bucket. You've got very complicated acoustics problems. You've got very complicated beam and plate problems. You've got a lot of fluid flows, including potential and laminar fluid flows. Um, so there are a lot of problems which we can very reliably apply the POD to. Anything with a periodic dimension, this is also going to have uh, a very good characterization based on the L2 norm because you've got global symmetry within the problem. So what about turbulence? Well, turbulence is not linear. Turbulence is multi-scale, and we understand that there is non-local energy scale transfer and spatial non-locality within terms including the pressure field. So of course, that doesn't fit. Uh, for periodic dimension, uh, there's a caveat here that in POD, this is pretty cool, uh, the POD returns Fourier modes, but only in dimensions that are analytically symmetric or analytically periodic. So that's a, that's a caveat for those who are more interested in the field in general. But generally, we cannot say that turbulence exhibits periodicity in all dimensions. So of course, turbulence is going to be hard to capture with POD if the general categories that work well with the L2 norm do not characterize turbulence. So perhaps it's understandable that this method does not work reliably. In fact, perhaps we're lucky that it works as well as it does, considering turbulence does not fall into any of these categories. So what is turbulence? And how do we understand it? We've talked about what it is not, but what is it? Uh, it looks like the animations are taking quite a bit of the memory on my computer. So thank you to everyone watching for the less than fluid animation that we're able to enjoy uh, locally here in Durham. So we understand that turbulence is formally chaotic. Uh, specifically, the, uh, Lyapunov, the largest Lyapunov exponent is greater than one. The system is um, unpredictable. It is extremely sensitive to initial conditions. A butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil and a hurricane happens off the coast of Florida. This is turbulence. This is the formation of chaos theory. This is one of the problems that characterizes that field of nonlinear dynamics. It's also multi-scale in space and time. You don't have a single large structure that is dominating the system. Instead, you've got complicated structures at the large scale, which are then made up of structures that are a little smaller. And then you have structures even smaller than that, and so on and so forth, all the way down. Um, these, are, um, these are very, very complicated structures. We understand that there's locality. We understand there's non-locality. Um, generally, the energy production happens at the larger scales. Generally, the dissipation happens at the smaller scales. In order to have uh, a comprehensive understanding of the system dynamics, we should capture both. We have to capture everything. This goes back to the idea of having empiricism at the smaller scales because we normally can't capture them very well. Well, the proper orthogonal decomposition is only optimized for these large scales. It only captures the energy production. This brings us to the hypothesis of our presentation that, uh, in theory, it brings us to that, but there it is. Better accounting for small scale dynamics will improve the quality of the basis. Now, we've left this open to interpretation so we can characterize success in quite a few ways. Do we have better ROMs with fewer modes? Do we have better predictability? There are a lot of ways that this can be characterized as good. Um, three ways of approaching this summarize the rest of the talk. Resorting the classic POD basis, employing two POD bases, one for large scales and one for small scales, and identifying a single multi-scale optimized basis with the, approach, with the attempt of having more predictability and more accuracy within all three. So the resorted POD, this section is going to be relatively quick. So classic POD modes are sorted by energy content. You take the mean of the norm, uh, the mean of the L2 norm of the velocity field, do a little bit of math using the characteristics of the proper orthogonal decomposition, and you see that the kinetic energy of every mode is defined by the eigenvalue. And these eigenvalues decay faster than in any other linear basis. So lambda 2 
is smaller than lambda one. It is the smallest smaller out of any popular, any possible linear basis. So again, you could use Fourier modes to capture the L2 norm, but the rate of decay of the eigenvalue spectrum is going to be much, much slower than it is with the POD basis. This is the fastest decaying basis as defined by the fastest decaying linear basis as defined by this L2 norm. Well, we understand that the velocity is characteristic of large scales. We also understand that the velocity gradient is characteristic of small scales. So what if we sorted them by the strain field? We know that the strain field is characteristic of small scales. So if we sort by the small scales, perhaps these large scale optimized modes will better capture the small scales and we will get better reduced order models. With a little bit of math, we can again turn uh, every mode into a single number, mu prime. Uh, I'll come back to the prime a little bit later. Uh, and the hope here is that we can look at the relationship between the lambdas and the mu primes and see a relationship. And in fact, we do. With periodic flows, you see a direct correlation between, so here on the x-axis, you've got the index lambda, and on the y-axis, you have the index of mu. So further left is a, a larger lambda, further down is a larger mu prime. You want to keep the larger lambdas and mu primes. At a period in the periodic flow, we see that the first 12 modes are equally important for both the large x-axis and small y-axis scales. This is really, really interesting. The reason that this is the case is because the scales are strongly coupled. A fluid flow is just as nonlinear at a Reynolds number of 14,000 as it is at a Reynolds number of 25,000. All the Reynolds number does is it improves. So the higher the Reynolds number, the less coupled these scales are going to be. So if we understand that at a Reynolds number of 14,000, the scales are strongly coupled, it's reasonable for us to expect that if we only retain the modes which capture equivalently the large and small scale norms, then we'll get a good result. So here we predict that if we run a reduced order model with only the first 12 modes, then the result will be accurate, as accurate as the basis can, uh, can yield. However, as we increase the Reynolds number, uh, this gets significantly messier. The big takeaway here is that there's not much of a pattern in the, uh, in the, along the line of identity. We, again, this makes sense. The less coupled the scales, the less coupled the scales. f of x is equal to f of x. So we have less predictability. However, let's go back to the periodic case. So the periodic case, if we run reduced order models, we see that, again, I have two error metrics here. The black one is less sensitive. The red one is more sensitive. Uh, zero is good. We see that if we only include if we only include the modes that are equivalently important for the large and the small scale norms, yeah, we get a fantastic answer. Uh, we don't exactly predict when it's going to go wrong, but before I ran any simulations, I was able to determine that twelve did give a good number. Unfortunately, and as is to be expected, uh, the result is not as good at higher Reynolds numbers. Um, however, if we resort the basis to include uh, modes based on how well they capture the small scales, again, these modes are not optimal for the small scales, they just can capture the small scales, then we actually see an improvement in the sensitivity to the basis in terms of how many modes we retain. You see a lot of sensitivity in the classic sorting, which is the middle plot, where you see a lot of fluctuation as you increase the dimension of the reduced order model by one or two, you see a dramatic change in the overall accuracy. Using the resorted basis, where we capture the, they are, the, the modes are designed to capture large scales, but we are sorting them based on how they capture the small scales in a global sense, you actually see that the sensitivity to the dimension is significantly lower. This is great. This means that 
we don't have to be immediately worried about the exact dimension. If we can get an order of magnitude assessment between 150 and 200, then that's good. Unfortunately, within the spectrum of modal indices, there's no reason for us to pick this particular re uh, range. So this is definitely a limited success. Um, it doesn't really work when the flow is chaotic. Uh, I, I, can, I can squint and see that it's slightly better in the resorted case. Again, it is better capturing the small scales, but no, there's an extreme sensitivity in both cases. So in general, the resorted POD we can find an, up, an a priori upper bound on the number of modes to use. We can also reduce the sensitivity to the modal basis size n. These are both ways of identifying better predictability within the reduced order model framework. However, the effectiveness is proportional to the scale coupling, which means it's less applicable to chaotic flows. This means that this is not really a good way to solve the problem. It was a good attempt, but the classic POD basis is really good for large scales and is difficult to predict at the small scales, just as we've understood for quite a while. So going back to our hypothesis, we're still looking at ways to capture the small scale dynamics. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is try and employ two POD bases instead of one. The classic POD norm optimization is there on the left. As a reminder, we have some solution that exists within the domain D, and the POD captures this solution space with an optimal linear basis. Well, there's a different linear, there's a different linear basis in a different part of the solution space, which is defined by the velocity gradient. So instead of trying to make the modes that capture the velocity also capture the velocity gradient, why don't we just use two bases? One for the velocity and one for the velocity gradient. If we do this, understanding that both bases can be found using the singular value decomposition, we're just giving a different snapshot matrix. Well, I'll start with the end So if we say f of x is equal to f of x, it is what it is. So the velocity gradient is the velocity gradient. If we expand these both with the two different bases, we identify a relationship between them so we can couple the coefficients of one basis with the coefficients of another basis. If we do this, then we see a, a, a relationship with the overall governing equations that we identified using the method that we talked about several slides ago. Doing this allows us to have reduced order models of the system using both bases, where the velocity is characterized by modes optimal for the velocity, and the velocity gradient is optimized based on modes that are optimized for the velocity gradient. The best thing is that it works. So this is the quasi-periodic flow. Uh, this is the one that did not work terribly well. It was extremely sensitive to the number of modes that we had. Uh, and you see the black line is the truth. The red line is our two basis reduced order model, which overlaps the black line almost exactly. And the classic POD approach, which is kind of all over the place. Because we have the gift of PowerPoint, we can look in animation form at this. And we see, well, hopefully we see if the animations behave, uh, we see that the result is more significant than we thought. Um, the global convection of the system exhibited in truth on the left is not captured at all by the POD basis. So even though the fluctuations are the correct amplitude, the actual physics of the system are not captured correctly. If we look on the right-hand side, this is our two basis POD ROM. And you'll see that it works very, very well. We have much, much better agreement in the overall dynamics of the system using our two basic POD instead of our classic POD approach. Even better, this works at the chaotic Reynolds number as well. Again, you see a remarkable agreement between the red and the black lines, and you see a poor agreement between the blue 
in the black lines. Blue is classic approach. Red is our approach. If you uh, look at the animations, again, you see the same thing. You see that the classic POD basis does not capture the global convection of the system nearly as well as the two basis approach. So let's talk about why that is. Hopefully, again, hopefully that uh, the uh, animations are coming at least bodily through to you. Um, so let's talk about why this is the case. If we look at the kinetic energy equation, which is directly derivable from uh, from the Navier-Stokes equations, from the governing equations that we started with, as a reminder, the fluctuating kinetic energy is um, just the UD component. This is the space. This is the fluctuation about the um, the mean flow U naught. We have four terms that define the evolution of kinetic energy within the system. Going left to right, you have the production term. You have the convection term, you have the dissipation term, and you have the transport term. The production term, uh, so one a priori metric of accuracy is if you have balanced the energy budget. You don't want the overall energy of the system to be wrong. So if this equation is satisfied well, that is one way of assessing whether the reduced order model is going to be good. The production term is how the energy moves from the mean flow to the fluctuations. This is, so the convection term is how the fluctuations move energy into the mean flow. So you've got energy moving both ways, and these two terms identify how different, uh, those, those different directions. The production term is mean flow to fluctuations. The convection term is fluctuations to mean flow. You have the dissipation term, which is where the fluctuating energy just goes away. It, uh, it rubs itself uh, into, can, into heat uh, at the very small scales. And then you've got transport, which is where the fluctuations uh, just feed energy around themselves. So these are the four terms that characterize the kinetic energy. The production term is defined by the gradient of the mean flow, we don't care about that, but it's only defined by the fluctuating velocity field. This means that the classic POD basis will help a lot, but there's no dependence on the fluctuating velocity gradients, so the um, velocity gradient basis psi isn't going to do anything for us. However, the convection term, this remember, the, the, accurate, the improved accuracy of the two basis approach was most readily apparent by looking at the global convection of the system. The convection term is defined based on the gradient of the fluctuating velocity field. Well, of course, that means that the classic POD modes don't help at all, but the velocity gradient modes help a lot. The dissipation term is a function of the Laplacian of the velocity fluctuations. And again, the small scale modes are more important there. The transport term is messy and nonlinear, and it's a function of all the modes, and everything is helpful. So uh, we're not the first ones to look at the energy equation. In fact, we barely looked at the energy equation. This, we're, we're looking at this more to understand why our approach works than to actually define it. Um, some excellent work has been done on the energy equation itself and how it relates to the POD approach. Uh, one seminal paper, well, oh yeah, this is only a priori if we know the... Uh, um, the kinetic energy as a function of time. Um, a, a previous graduate student in our lab used this equation to very effectively reduce the uh, dimension of, a, of a, a POD basis using this equation, but it only worked because the system was statistically stationary. So uh, a seminal paper that looked at the kinetic energy of the system is by Bernd Nowak. It came out of JFM in 2005. Uh, and he was able to, he and his authors were able to identify specifically how much of each term was contributing. And you see that the production and the convection are very, very important. And the dissipation is dynamically significant, but small in energy content. Um, and we see that in our approach, we can ignore pressure for our case. We have the phi modes capturing the positive side of this scale and the 
psi modes, the small scale modes, capturing the negative side of the scale. So if we balance the approach better, then it's understandable that it will work better. So going back to uh, the only a priori method that we had originally, looking at the eigenvalue spectrum, well, we had two numbers associated with every mode based on the resorted POD approach. Now, it's a mu prime here, but the exact same gradient norm can be characterized by our small scale modes psi as well. So we can look at lambdas and mu's. It's reasonable to understand that the large scales are captured to a certain degree by retaining a lot of lambda, and the small scales are captured to a good degree by all of mu. So it is much more dynamically reasonable for us to say that retaining a majority of both of these sums, 99% of the lambdas and 99% of the mu's, would be enough to give us an accurate result. Um, we see numbers here uh, for the actual amount of modes we need in the uh, large and small scales at the three Reynolds numbers that we've been playing with. We're going to pick 99% as uh, as the amount that we need to retain. Again, it should be less sensitive because we understand the velocity and the velocity gradient are the only two things that we need to care about. And so if we capture both of those in totality up to a certain extent, then we should be pretty good. Uh, what we find is that this is good. Um, the results that you saw on a previous page were in fact the numbers that we picked based on 99%. Before I ran in any simulations, I decided to run at 17,000 with 96 POD modes, uh, velocity modes, and 156 small scale modes. And we got a great answer. Doing this um, worked really, really well. We can actually go a step further though. So if we look at the relationship between the large scale coefficients A and the small scale coefficients B, we actually see that they're characterized by the exact same matrix of integrals, LRE, which is uh, also used to define the small scale dissipation within the actual governing equation. This gives us, uh, this gives us another step to understanding how to predict the accuracy of our results. So we know that this matrix, LRE, characterizes the coupling of the two bases. For periodic flows, we know that low magnitudes within this matrix indicate the mode is not necessary. For chaotic flows, we know that higher values within this matrix are necessary. Now this sounds like the same thing twice, but Really, it's, it's, it's importantly different. So the, in the periodic flows, having spurious modes is okay because spurious modes don't detract from the strong coupling. With chaotic flows, having spurious modes is problematic because it introduces dynamics at a scale of dynamical significance, which are incorrect. So it's, it's careful to avoid one where the other is an identification of just moving forward. We also know that small scale dynamics are higher dimension. This means that we need more small scale modes than large scale modes. We also know that the global kinetic energy is important. It's one of the invariants of the system and we need to capture it reasonably well. So we should still retain a certain large percentage of the kinetic energy norm. <clears throat> uh, however, as we increase the Reynolds number, this, retired, this required retention should be known to lessen. The reason we expect this is because the small scales are more dynamically significant at higher Reynolds numbers. Therefore, it's less important to only retain a high percentage of the velocity field itself, of the kinetic energy norm itself. So what we have here are a set of rules where from a dynamical perspective, if we, sat, if we follow these rules, we should have an accurate reduced order model. If we look, uh, yeah, and we capture dissipation dynamics. That's really important. We have to capture dissipation dynamics within this whole system. So if we look at the magnitude 
of the um, elements of the LRE matrices, we see that there's a trend. The uh, diagonal white line is the line of identity, so that's n equals m. So we, again, following our rules, we know that only accurate models are going to exist to the right of that line. The horizontal white line is 99% of the kinetic energy. So we need to be above the horizontal line and to the right of the diagonal line. Uh, I see a question from the chat. It's a good one, uh, but I'm going to wait to the end of the talk to hit it. So thank you for the question, and we're going to hit that at the end of the talk. Um, for the sake of computational complexity, uh, we're going to... Oh yeah, so for uh, a periodic case, we see very, very good agreement between the accuracy of the reduced order model and the trends that we observe within the LRE matrix. This means that we can identify specifically the range of reduced order models which is going to be accurate before we actually run any simulations. So the plot on the top took a couple of seconds to compute. It was necessary to compute for us to build reduced order models at all. The plot on the bottom took quite a while because every point on that plot was a different reduced order model. So every, every reduced order model only takes a couple of seconds to run, but if you're running thousands of reduced order models to try and understand the parameter space, it, it's not feasible. So if we can predict the range or even just a couple of points where the reduced order models are known, expected with confidence to be accurate, that's a huge, that's a huge step. So we see for a periodic Reynolds number that it works. We can predict precisely that if we retain, if we follow our rules, we can identify the range of uh, reduced order model sizes, n for the large, n for the velocity modes, and m for the velocity gradient modes. We have an accurate reduced order model. What's even better is that it works at higher Reynolds numbers. So again, the horizontal uh, above the horizontal line and to the right of the diagonal line, this is the region where we see the accurate reduced order models. I should have said uh, blue on these bottom plots is low, is zero error and red is twenty percent error. So blue is good, red is bad. So we see above ninety nine percent. Now again, I'm not saying that only above those is where the accuracy is going to be. What I'm saying is that we can predict that there is an accurate result specifically between those lines. And it even works at a chaotic Reynolds number. So we lower the computational complexity a little bit. So we said 90% 90, 90 retention instead of 99% retention. And again, it works. We see an agreement between our prediction of where the accurate results are going to be and the results themselves. We also see a low sensitivity to the number of small scale modes. This is significant. What you see here is an animation of the error trends in N with increasing M. So every frame of this animation is a different number of small scale modes but the plots themselves are a trend in the number of large-scale modes. You'll see that after, <clears throat> after a certain number of small-scale modes have been added, it doesn't get any better or worse for, a smaller, for the lower mode numbers. So essentially, the, uh, the plot is constructing itself. So the accuracy with 10 large modes does not change if you use 50 or 300 small scale modes. This is great. What this means is that we have, what this means is that we have a low sensitivity to the number of small scale modes that we retain. We also see this at a Reynolds number of 17,000 where, again, the results have converged as we increase the number of M. And we actually see the same thing, to a lesser extent, at a Reynolds number of 25,000. 
it is still problematic. It, it, what this shows is that there is more non-locality at the larger scales, but that's to be expected. What, the important thing to conclude here is that there is a low sense, a lower sensitivity to M than there is to N. This is great because it reduces the dimension of our problem. So in general, the two basis POD approach has the, has the following results. We have an a priori truncation based on, for both bases, based on dynamically meaningful uh, uh, understandings. We have a relationship between the number of modes N and the number of modes M that need to be retained. There is a low sensitivity to the number of small scale modes. This is great because we know that we need more of them. So as long as we have more of them, we know that we don't need to worry much more than that. We also know that this is applicable to all Reynolds numbers that we tested, not just the simple periodic ones. Now, the ROM dimension may be large at higher Reynolds numbers, but I'll put an asterisk on large because large is not, still not nearly as expensive as uh, the reference flows. So the DNS took days or weeks to run. The largest reduced order models took minutes to run. So we're still talking about a huge savings in computational cost. So a couple more slides and we're done. The last approach is the multi-scale POD. So we have these two solution spaces, one characterized by the velocity field and one characterized by the velocity gradient field. Well, it's worth considering, what if we tried to capture both of these optimizations within a single scalable norm? What if we were then able to make sure that the result was still unique and easy to compute using something like the SVD. Now, in this slide, going from the black optimization equation to the red result that it's still solvable, this took quite a few pages of math. <laughs> uh, conceptually, tr trust, trust me, uh, it works. <laughs> uh, and I can share my documentation with anyone who'd like to see it. Um, we were able to find a unique solution to this optimization problem, uh, and we were able to compute modes for it. So. It takes a couple of SVDs to do with some sort of computational efficiency, but it is feasible. It can be done. So if we look at the classic POD mode on the left, this is the velocity mode, and we look at the velocity gradient mode on the right, the left mode is optimized for the large scales. The right mode is optimized for the small scales. What we see with our multi-scale POD approach so yeah, so the left ones are optimized for production and the right ones are optimized for dissipation. What we see with the multi-scale POD approach is that a different coherent structure evolves. It is a combination of both the production and the dissipation scales in a single mode. The same is observed at a Reynolds number of 25,000. We have a different characteristic coherent structure from this basis than we have from either of the individual bases. These modes are not ready for prime time yet. Uh, they don't satisfy the boundary conditions correctly. This is uh, this is a limitation of the approach which we are working uh, we are working on right now. This will be one of the immediate avenues of future work is pursuing pursuing this method further and improving its ability to satisfy the boundary conditions. But the fact that we have identified different coherent structures is in itself encouraging. It identifies that we are looking at an intersection of two functions within the parameter space within a single modal basis. The final slide, which we've all been waiting for. So to sum up, we've looked at three approaches that all, appro that all attempt to solve the problem that the classic POD basis does not yield predictably accurate Galerkin reduced order models. This is the fundamental problem that we've been trying to solve. By resorting the classic modal basis, we found a reduced sensitivity to ROM dimension, improved predictability, but only for periodic flows. This is the least helpful. Periodic flows are the simplest to begin with. So the fact that we were able to do this is not that significant. The two basis POD ROMs, this was a significant step forward. We have a conservative a priori truncation of both bases, we have low sensitivity to small scale dimension above threshold, which we understand from a dynamical perspective. And we understand that it's applicable to all flow regimes. Now the ROM dimension may be high. We understand that we're not optimizing for the whole dimension of the system, but uh, this is a really, really good step. And even the large reduced order models are still quite a bit faster than the DNS. 
Multi-scale POD is the final approach. We found a unique basis, which is optimal for a combination of velocity and gradient fields. Uh, we also understand that the modes capture structures which govern both the large and the small scales because that's what the optimization does. However, uh, the modes must be adjusted to capture the regime boundary conditions. That requires iteration, and when you introduce iteration to a chaotic problem, things get messy. So that's the summary of the results that comprise my dissertation. Uh, I'd like to take a moment and thank my advisor, Dr. Earl Dowell. He has helped me immensely and immeasurably over the past four years that I've been here. Uh, I've learned more from him than I could have imagined possible a couple of years ago. So I thank him sincerely. Uh, I thank you all sincerely for watching this virtually. Um, I thank all 40 or 50 people who are still watching live for the stamina to get through the entire presentation. I'm sure you understood every slide perfectly. Uh, thank you to my committee. Uh, Dr. Bragg taught me an immense amount about turbulence. I am, uh, I am amazed at how complicated and deep that field is, and I hope one day I have his level of understanding. Uh, thanks to Dr. Mann for teaching me the fundamentals of nonlinear dynamics and uh, a lot of fundamentally intuitive uh, perspectives on the way to approach these problems. Thanks to Dr. Hall for his remarkable understanding of aerodynamics. And um, thanks to Dr. Gavin for his remarkable understanding of linear algebra and linear spaces. Uh, and thanks uh, again to everyone else for coming. Uh, with that, I have a couple of questions waiting in the chat, so I'll hit those. And as always, I welcome my committee to pipe in pretty much whenever they'd like. Uh, so we had an excellent question submitted partway through the talk. Uh, if I need to know the answer just to get a good prediction, why is it helpful? Don't I already know the answer by definition? This is an excellent question, and it's a fundamental question that people who do reduce order modeling are pretty used to defending, so I'll do my best. So yes, we need to know the answer in a sense. So we need to have samples of the dynamics, which we then use to simulate the system, identify the modal bases, and move forward. However, uh, I'll give you two ways that the reduced order models can be more helpful than the truth. One has to do with the parameter space. So if I run one extremely expensive simulation at one Reynolds number with one set of boundary conditions at one temperature, one angle of attack, you can pick whatever, whatever parameter definitions you want for the problem at hand, that's really expensive. And I cannot say in any sense that if I change that parameter space even slightly, what the answer is going to be. I don't know if I increase the angle of attack by one degree, what exactly are the dynamics going to look like? I'm not talking about stable flow. I'm talking about if you go if you go from alpha 41 to alpha 42 degrees, where you've got separated flow one going to separated flow two, these are going to be fundamentally different dynamical systems. However, the governing equation is the same. So if you have coherent structures spanned by a basis of modes phi and psi, as we've, as we've explored here, and you understand from a dynamical perspective, as we've established here, why a certain number of those together span the totality of the dynamics that are significant for the system, you can much more confidently use that truncated basis to explore the parameter space. So sure, you still have to run one or two extremely expensive simulations, but reduced order models allow you to get the results for hundreds or thousands of expensive simulations at different points in the parameter space for the computational cost of one or two. The other side of that is the modes themselves are interesting. So yes, we need the answer, but if I have the answer, I'll, I'll quote Anique Pouquet here, um, she's a, a turbulence researcher who's done some of the most astounding, beautiful, high-resolution, high-fidelity simulations of turbulence that we've seen in the past 15 years. Um, she told me once that the reason that we haven't solved turbulence is we keep moving the goalpost. If we only identify that which we don't understand as turbulence, it'll never be solved. So if we, don't, we, we may have the simulations, but we may not know what to look for. If you give me you know, terabytes of very accurate data, I'm not necessarily going to know where in the volume to look for a coherent structure, what coherent structures dominate what frequencies. If I'm looking at 
For example, if I'm looking to capture flutter or some nonlinear instability in the structure that can be coupled to fluids, then the, the coherent structures identified from the modal basis are a way for me to do that. So excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, the second question and final question that I have from the audience is, can I comment on what people do when they do not have access to full order high fidelity models to generate snapshots? This is, again, a really good question along the same lines. You can use anything you want. Yeah, so if you have finite element simulations, if you have wind tunnel experiments, if you have, um, if you have a RANS simulation, yeah, you can do this. And the this approach can work with any degree of fidelity. This approach defines how optimally you can capture the dynamics of your simulations. So the simulation's accuracy is important, but perhaps more important is the fact that we understand how to control how to recapitulate those dynamics. That's more fundamental, and that's what we've tried to approach here. Thanks a lot for the question, Rudy. Uh, one more question that was just submitted, and I'll give you a 10-second answer because I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting a wave that my committee is getting impatient. If you can explore the parameter space by finding your modes for only a few sets, why did you compare all your results to the same parameters used to make them? This is an excellent question. So we were testing these approaches. So we had to test them to make sure that it worked. So we, we, were, we were comparing them to the truth because we had it. The next step is to explore the parameter space further with these modes and see how robust it is for parametric extra extrapolation. Our hypothesis is that by capturing the dynamics, we capture the parameter space, which means that this modal basis will be robust as we extrapolate. Uh, this is going to be a, an avenue of future work and a really, really valuable one. Thanks again for the question. Uh, with that, I think I'm through all the questions that have been submitted from the audience. Thank you all so much for attending. I think at this point, we're going to end the public stream so that my committee can ask me all the, all the really tricky questions without the public voice. So I will say farewell on Twitch. Thank you all so much for coming and watching. And hopefully, I will have good news to report on social media in a couple of hours when my committee is done grilling me. <laughs>